why am I making this vlog at all? Why am I at the World Championships in Finland? What is this about? What do I want? What do I hope to gain? What am I trying to prove? What's the point? It is Wednesday morning and I am getting ready to do the relay. They put me on the USA team, so they dropped me down a few age categories. So I'm going to be skiing with Master 3 and Master 4 athletes, which are 40 to 49, essentially. Um, so it was kind of fun to drop down with the younger guys. Anyway, it's a 5K relay, same course as yesterday, uh, the 5K skate that we did. Two classic legs, two skate legs. I'm the final anchor leg, the skate leg. And I'm excited to ski my own race by the time the fourth leg comes around. People should be rather spread out. So hopefully I get to actually ski without panicking and use good technique. So I'm hoping to have a faster time today. Also, it's a little bit warmer. It's 11 degrees Fahrenheit, toasty. <laughs> so. I went with a warmer wax on one pair of skis and then the same cold waxes on two other skis. So I'm going to test those out, see how they do. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to do a relay. I did not plan on it, but I'm looking forward to it. And it'd be fun to race with some other US guys and hopefully be in the medal hunt. Super coach, <laughs> JD, John Downing, how are you feeling about today? Go USA. <laughs> Hi, I'm Randy Bladel from uh, Anchorage. This is a trick I started doing years ago. Wear some sort of nitrile or latex exam glove underneath your regular gloves. Uh, this one I also have a toe warmer stuck to my thumb because that's always the one that gets coldest from when we raced yesterday in below zero weather. The heat of vaporization of water is huge. So yeah, my hands get wet inside these gloves from sweat, but it doesn't evaporate. It doesn't get my gloves wet. It stays warmer. Use a, a large size glove. Don't get something tight. Uh, that, that's actually detrimental. But this will make any glove warmer. <laughs> Try it. Also in men's category 3 USA. Elastic chain, Adam Lewis has opened. Ja aika moinen aika muuten Juha Almille, vaikka siinä vaihtosäädöissäkin sanoisin, että meni noin 7 10 sekuntiin, mutta silti yksi tuntia. Ja sitten miesten kategoriaan. Ja sitten tulee kolme joukkuetta loppusuoralle on the home catch Team USA. It's a balmy 8 degrees Fahrenheit. Anybody care for a dip? Second and the single medalist, Toinen ja Opea, Team USA. Ja voittoon maailman mestaruuden, mestaruuteen kultaa. Gold and World Champion, Suomi, Finland. I'm on foot the entire trip. So at night after races and awards and dinner, we walk a mile through the woods back to our cabin. Tonight it's snowing, so the sky's a bit lighter, but it's pretty dark, but it's also stunning to walk through here under moonlight. Feels like a real Finnish adventure. Just getting home from the relay award ceremony. My heart did its thing about halfway through the race. It was mild and I thought, okay, just settle down for a bit and maybe it won't do a full blast. But from that point forward, I basically hit the wall. So I just assumed that I went out too hard. But when I looked at the heart rate data later, I didn't go out too hard. My heart rate was under 160 for the first half of the race. And then you see the jump and it jumps up to 186 and stayed super high the rest of the race. So uh, not ideal for me. Um, it happens when it happens. Hopefully it doesn't happen in the 30K, but uh, 
managed to finish without a, a major blow up. So just a mild blip. The sidewalks or bike paths or pedestrian lanes, whatever you want to call them, are almost as wide as the road and they're everywhere. I'm in a grocery store parking lot and there's eight charging stations for electric cars. A lot of people say that you can't use an electric car in a cold environment, but obviously you can. A supermarket in Finland in a small town and they have TV screens advertising prices. It's super advanced. Everybody wants some boy? Mama. Every Finnish bathroom I've been in, even one here in a public store, has a little bidet handle uh, to clean your undercarriage. <laughs> it's amazing, even in a public restroom they have them. Walking through the little neighborhood that we're staying in, trying to figure out what to call the color of this house. <laughs> More orange than mustard. And so this is what the roads look like after they plow them. Uh, they've been snow covered and hard packed ever since we've been here. So I don't know if you ever actually see the road this time of year. And they all drive so fast. This is our street here and we're staying in a unit that looks just like that one ahead. So, race number one, the experience I had in the event was that of frustration because they had classic tracks and skate tracks groomed together on one trail because we had a one to two hour window to get both races done. They didn't have a chance to regroom. So there wasn't a lot of room to pass as a skater because you would have to go into these double classic tracks which are hard and got divots in them. So there's like four big divots on the left side of the trail. So if you tried to go into the classic tracks to pass someone, you would slow down because your poles kept slipping and your skis would go in and out of the divots and you couldn't pass. So really the only opportunity to pass people in that first race was on the downhills. My skis were a little bit slower than the guys I was skiing with. So on every downhill, they would pull a little bit away from me. So I couldn't get around them. I tried many times using the classic tracks and it was just too clumsy and they would get a little bit ahead. So I'd tuck in behind, we'd get to a downhill and I'd skate as fast as I could with my legs, but their skis are faster and they were in the, the classic tracks for the downhills. Anyway, no way to get around. So my experience was frustration. I want to get around these two guys that are skiing two abreast, which is totally rude. And the lead pack is just a couple seconds ahead of us. They're like 50 feet in front of us, a train of five guys. And I want to be on that train, but I can't get there because of these two guys. So when it came to the final downhill, I'm trapped behind these two guys and their skis are a little bit faster. And when we got to the, the long flat before the final climb, I couldn't get around them. Uh, I couldn't get around them on the final hill and I ended up I think 11 seconds outside of the win ninth place so there were nine guys within 11 seconds um, two more people passed me on the downhill faster skis so my story post race was one of frustration I had more in the tank and I couldn't use it because these two guys were in front of me is that true well let's look at the data if I go to Strava and I look at my heart rate, it was well under my normal race heart rate. And this is a 5K, so in a 5K, my heart rate should be right around 170. Uh, not for the first, say, half to three quarters of a mile, but once we've gotten about three quarters of a mile into the race, my heart rate will get to 169 to 171, and it'll stay there for the rest of the race. I barely got over 160 in this race. I think my average heart rate was 158. That's a clear indicator that I was not skiing at my maximum race pace. Okay, good data. And I'm only nine seconds out of the win. And these guys had faster skis than I did. So fantastic, I'm confident. But then I get into the relay and I hammer from the start. 
absolutely hammered and I'm feeling good. I fly up the first climb like it's not even there. And I'm feeling really confident I'm gonna catch the Finnish team in front of us about a minute and a half. I'm gonna make up that minute and a half in 5K. That's how I skied. But then there got a point where, I don't know what happened, but my heart did a flutter. And when I get that feeling, I know that an attack of SVT is coming, supraventricular tachycardia, where my heart rate can shoot up to 200 beats a minute out of nowhere. And I could feel the flutter. My heart was unstable. And I'm like, oh, crap. So back off. Don't push. Let's see if we can get it to go back to normal. And there was a climb just after it hit that flutter. So I backed off my pace a bit. And I thought, okay, I don't think it's going full attack. It doesn't feel like a full attack. But I, I feel fragile. And then suddenly I just got really tired. And that climb, which I would have V2'd up, Suddenly, I'm V1-ing up the climb and thinking, oh my God, I went out too hard. I'm spent. So then for the rest of the race, maybe the last two kilometers, I was just spent. My legs were gone. So I finished the race. I am exhausted. My legs feel like bricks. And it's like, that was an awful experience. I looked at my time. It was over a minute slower than the day before. And then I looked at other skiers and what their times were, and they were similar in time to the day before. I'm the only one that slowed down. So now my identity and narrative engine wants to tell a story about going out too hard, like I blew it. But then over the course of the day, it occurred to me, well, your heart did have a flutter. Let's look at the data. Let's see what your heart rate monitor shows on Strava. I was skiing faster than the day before, but my heart rate was still not at max until I got to the point where it fluttered. And then out of nowhere, it jumps to 186. It went from 150 something to 186. And it's a vertical line that it just goes straight up. I never, ever in a race see my heart rate get above the low 170s. It's just not possible at my age to get my heart rate that high unless I have an attack of SVT. And that extra heart rate doesn't mean extra performance. It means that my heart is beating inefficiently and it's desperately trying to move oxygen around, which is why you get tired. Um, because your heart is beating in several different places instead of one. Uh, and that's what SVT is. So you get an erratic beat. You've got competing rhythms happening at the same time instead of one that pumps efficiently. So you get very little oxygen anyway. So then I was curious, well, let's go back and look at the two courses. They're identical. Let's see my time on the top of the first climb. And let's see my time just before my heart fluttered. So the first climb in race number one, the 5K individual, took me a minute 36 seconds. In the relay, it took me a minute and eight. So I was 28 seconds faster just in the beginning of the course. And yeah, I was going much, much faster, but my heart rate was fine. And then when I get to the point just before the flutter, I was still over 30 seconds faster than the day before. And then everything fell off the rails after that. So why am I going into all this detail? Because the more time I spend thinking about it and recalling what happened, and the more time I spend looking at data, you gotta collect the data, number one, the more I begin to see a different picture emerging. So after race one, frustration, disappointment. I want to ski with those guys. I think I can. Well, the data says I can. My heart rate wasn't that high. So my frustration of being blocked, it's real. It's showing up in the data. Okay, day two, did I go out too hard? Well, my story says yes. The data says I didn't. Okay, did I just crap out? That's what my story said. And it started saying that you're going to suck in the 30K. Look at this. You can't even do two 5Ks back to back. Your legs are completely shot. You're totally out of gas. No way you can ski with these guys in a 30K. Well, I look at the data and now suddenly I have a different story. You skied really well for two and a half K. Your heart went nuts. And of course, things fell off the rails. We're going to walk the 200 meters down the road to the ski trails from our cabin. And Lena says these houses here look like 1970s Swedish homes.
There's about three feet of snow on the ground. And I packed this trail down so we'd get easier access. I'm back at the cabin all clean and toasty. And I had some rather interesting shower thoughts that I thought would be important to share because they relate to this vlog and also to the data that I've been collecting about the past two races. My brain does fun things in the shower. Anyway, I've been having a really difficult time continuing the story that this blog is really built on. And I want to tell you why. It's not just lack of time for editing, while that is an important component. It's more that I really don't know what my story is. So I have to keep jumping out and taking a look at the bigger picture. Why am I making this vlog at all? Why am I at the World Championships in Finland? What is this about? What do I want? What do I hope to gain? What am I trying to prove? What's the point? Well, if we rewind a couple years, an injured runner, myself, decided to take on a new sport out of curiosity as a game to see if I could use my new gentle approach to training where I never push myself, I never use willpower, I don't go hard unless I'm absolutely excited to, and it's more like a dog off leash that wants to run really fast after something, wants to chase it. But other than that, there is no pushing. Can I, using this approach, reinvent myself into a different kind of athlete? Okay, I've had a great deal of success as a runner, but skiing is a very different sport. There's a lot of upper body strength, a lot of leg strength, a lot of core strength, just strength and power in general, plus cardiovascular capacity that exceeds that of running. And there's the technique, which is so complex and subtle, it's hard to wrap your brain around. And I'm absolutely in love with learning it. And then there's the equipment. There's the skis, there's the poles, there's the waxing, there's the tools that you use after you've waxed. It's incredibly complex. There is so much to learn. It's not like running where you just go out and run and if you consistently build your mileage over time, you will become a better runner. Skiing is very, very different. You've got to work on a lot of different things. So can I, using this gentle approach, learn this new technique, build a very strong upper body? Because as a runner, I never did anything for my upper body. Up until maybe 2009, I was doing some upper body strength for stair climbing races. I would grab a lat pull down machine and I would just pull the bar toward me to simulate pulling on the railing, but I didn't do a whole lot of that. So when I started this new strength journey, I was weak. So can I build strength? Can I build technique? Can I learn about the equipment? Can I learn about the preparation and maintenance of the equipment and all that goes along with that? Is it possible in my 50s to take on a new sport and get really good at it? I don't know, I'm really curious to find out. So that's why this vlog exists. Because I've got a new project, I've got a new game to play. And it's not one of trying to prove a particular diet is superior, although I am still plant-based. But it's not really about diet anymore. It's more about a gentle, compassionate approach that doesn't require a plan, that doesn't require willpower. Can I, in just a couple years, get really good and compete on a world stage and challenge for the podium? That was the goal. Do I need that podium? No. Is this about personal glory or pride? No. It's an experiment, just like my experiment in 2019, using my Bigfoot and Bigfoot light walking strides to break the American record for the road mile over 50, which I did. Very gentle, easy training, using a silly walk with almost no running at all, when I was able to run a 446 mile on a hilly course with lots of sharp corners. Anyway, that was a successful experiment. So what's next? Well, this is it, becoming a skier, becoming a really good skier, a sport that is far more complex and difficult than running. So anyway, why has it been difficult for me to continue this vlog? Because I forgot that story. I forgot what this is about. And suddenly my identity gets involved and it's frustrated because people are blocking me in the 5K race and I need to be on that podium. I need to prove something. You're here. You're at the World Championships and you're in the mix. You're right there with the top guys. It's proven. 
You don't need to be on the podium. You don't need to win the race. You're right there. And you never train hard. You're just moving throughout the day very gently. So which story am I telling and whose story is it? Is it Tim looking at the big picture saying, wow, what a great success? Or is it Tim as an identity in the moment feeling thwarted because he knows he could have done it. He knows he could have been on that podium and now it's been taken away. Is that really what it was about? No. But my identity got a hold of it and said, this is mine. I'm going to celebrate this. I'm going to look good if I'm on that podium. But that's not why I'm doing this, which is why I have to keep stepping out of my identity because it wants stuff like that. And it gets frustrated and it gets upset and disappointed and then it wants to go sulk in the corner. So was that first race a success? Absolutely. But I had to wait before telling that story. So... I'm pumped. Can't wait for the 30K. Dinner tonight is beet pasta with broccoli, hummus, and mashed sweet potato and regular potato.